I'm so glad to be here today, and I want to thank Lisa and um, the UNM Bookstore for having us. It's so great when people are willing to acknowledge and, and give new writers a voice and a forum in which to read. Um, and I also want to thank West End Press, of course, for cutting me a really big break and publishing my first book. So, a lot of my poems um, are stories that my mother told me. Um, my mother is a very, she had a very hard childhood and she's a very interesting, kind of eccentric person in many ways. It's probably good she's not here to hear me say this. But anyway, um, Erica once asked me who I write for, who my voice is for, and I really have to say my voice is for my mother. Um, my father is of course very dear to me, but my, I, you know, I'd be lying if I didn't say my voice was for my mother. Um, and in in that vein, I would like to start off with one of my favorite poems, and it's called Thirteen, and it's about my mother. Thirteen. My mother wanted short hair so much, it didn't stop her, even though she says her father wept when she went to the beauty shop in downtown Okmulgee to have her braids cut off. But she was 13 and old enough to do what she wanted with her hair. Her father asked her to carry the braids home so he could keep them. He gave her a white tie box before she walked out the door. I wonder what my mother thought about on the way home. Did she know it would be so quick, so easy? Did she know how light it would feel? When she arrived at the front door, she presented the braids in the white box to her father, a floral delivery with nothing to sign to indicate his acceptance. He walked with them to his makeshift office in the back, somberly opened the top desk drawer, put in the box, and closed it like a mausoleum of her girlhood. Even when she went back to 1500 South Delaware, back to Okmulgee from California for the holidays, she always knew her braids were still in the same white box in her father's top desk drawer, as if she might someday change her mind and ask to have them back. I'm sort of just flipping through this and reading as the spirit moves me, so to speak, in an informal way. Um, this is about, this is very much an Oklahoma poem called Tornado Siren. <laughs> and um, I always kind of wanted to see a tornado. I didn't actually want to be in one, but I was very sorry. I, I uh, got out of Oklahoma without having it, except seeing it on TV. So it's always kind of this, this kind of morbid kind of excitement and anxiety that goes with that. So that's fun. Yeah. And this is called Tornado Siren. It traces a circle in the air with a monotone, monotonous drone. That's the Doppler effect, like a train, my dad says. That change in loudness and pitch. There's nothing like it. John says if I'm lucky, I'll see a tornado, like the time he saw a white stovepipe emerge from a wall cloud across the river. When it met the grocery store, it turned black as its patchwork of debris wove itself closer and closer until it became a knotted thing in the busy, angry funnel. I don't think I ever want to be that kind of lucky. It's a good day for it, though, when birds vanish from a bottle green sky. Those who know Oklahoma say it's the still that's so unsettling. And when the siren's warning fills the air, I only hope to witness when the tornado dips, a sewing needle undoing threads of someone else's life, leaving my own intact. This next poem is called Mohawk Horsebreaker, and I promised to read it for my friend Erica, so, who's a wonderful friend and um, colleague and inspiration to me, so this one's for Erica. Mohawk Horsebreaker. His saddle now an oxygen tank, his ropes now it's tubing across his shoulders around his neck. My daddy put me on my first horse when I was six, Philip tells me. His voice rises in anticipation as if he hears a tangle of galloping hooves from an Idaho valley. His eyes shift focus from me toward the ceiling as he reaches for memory. How do you break them, I ask? 
Philip laughs. You just stay on. When I was nine, I was breaking horses with men who were 20. Then his eyes darken over, stars covered by a bank of storm clouds, as Philip leaves the moment and return where he lies now. He releases a sigh, the same kind of sigh exhausted pintos must have let go under his craggy weight. Now I smile at his lizard boots, sticking out of crumpled hospital bedding, indicative of his unbroken will. I sure do love them horses, he declares, and closes his eyes so he can rejoin the world he knew before. This is um, one of my favorite ones. This is about um, a trip to Seattle I took with three, when I was in nursing school, we saved up enough money to go to Seattle for a summer. Not for a summer, but for like three days, really, in the summer. <laughs> and it sounds like grandiose. But anyway, this one's um, called The Son of God. At the bus stop, he approaches us to deliver his message on a poster with worn corners. He yells at us through the glass in his Caribbean dialect while pounding his staff, festooned with bottle caps and plastic jewels onto the dirty sidewalk. He shakes a sign in perfect synchronicity with his staff as if he is a leader of a marching band. The Seattle police are liars. They are all Satan. The church is full of liars. I am the son of God. The remaining paint letters are blocked by the bus door, but he sees me through the window, leaning to read the rest of his message, and fixates on my eyes. His blaze with fanaticism. I look away quickly, then back, thinking it might be safe, but it isn't. Finally, the driver reaches for the handle to pull the door shut with a gasp. As we lurch away from the curb, I join the others in the conspiracy of pretending he's not really there, as if we're all embarrassed for him. Still, I turn and watch the Son of God back away from our bus and approach people leaving a Starbucks with backpacks or briefcases. They hold their coffees tightly as he searches for the one who may be his prodigal. This is, um, this poem is called Aunt Pearl, and this is um, from my mother's very colorful family. <laughs> and um, I never met Aunt Pearl, I just heard a lot of stories about her. And um, this is one of them, Aunt Pearl. She was not all that far from Salisaw, right across the river in Fort Smith. My grandfather asked my mother to call her aunt even though she was really his first of three wives, as if, as if this would help a 13-year-old girl whose mother, his second wife, had died. When he crossed the threshold of her screen door, he'd always call, Pearl, Pearl, it's weighty. My mother always trailed behind him like she was told. Aunt Pearl didn't see well anymore and kept a loaded revolver at her nightstand, even though she was a Pentecostal. All good Christians should defend their homes the best they know how. My mother would wait in the kitchen during their visits. She'd drink a Coke and study Aunt Pearl's world of canned spice peaches and mason jars, pickled beets, a Reader's Digest tented on the old wooden table, the smell of linen on the clothesline just beyond the open window. She says she liked Aunt Pearl, a good woman who punctuated her father's life like her own mother did, the same way wooden clothespins keep laundry far enough apart to dry completely without falling from the line. I'm going to read um, probably a couple more, um, maybe one more about my mother, and then one more, one, I want to read one about the kind of work that I do as a um, psychiatric nurse, which I really love. and. I went into nursing sort of as a 
something I didn't want to do, you know, like, no, no, never, never, no, I'm going to make my life as a writer, but it's so hard, and I admire people like Erica so much who actually do it and teach and, and immerse themselves in that world, but, but I chose to take another route, and I ended up really loving it in a way that, I, that surprises me. So um, it's just, you know, every day I learn something from them. I'm a nurse at the VA, and it just, it's so heartbreaking to see them as they come back from the war. And those with the wounds from the previous war, um, and especially, you know, Native Americans are always the ones who go fight for our country. And it, it's really, it's heartbreaking, but then, you know, the inner strength that they have is, um, is still evident, very much so. So, um, I'm gonna, I'll read this one first. This, this gentleman was not a, um, from the VA, I used to work at Caseman. But he's someone who made a great impact on me. Um, it's called Todd. It is a day of your discharge and you are busy stripping institution sheets from the long hospital twin bed. I walk by and see you with one hand on your walker, balancing yourself like a sailboat steady by its keel. For now, you're not a frightened swimmer in your delusions, and you leave your room with your key clear patient belongings bag tied to the front of your walker. It shows your personal effects like stomach contents. There is even your Easter basket, which many patients threw away days ago. You still have your yellow and green plastic grass and now empty eggs. In your basket too, you have your signed discharge instructions, your prescriptions, and directions to the sample clinic rolled into one like a cardboard megaphone. When I look at you, read the psychiatrist notes, assessments of your life, of your schizophrenia, it's hard to believe we're almost the same age. I think I'll read um, I'll read one more, and this um, sort of takes me back to my, you know, growing up in Tennessee and how Tennessee is so different, but there are wonderful things, but there are a lot of bad things about Tennessee too, so it's like, I guess like every place else, so I still kind of love it with all its faults, but um, it's, it's all out there, so. This one's called Mecca from our garage. The Muslims were employed for odd jobs, to help before but not after. Still, I never noticed them much, except for their efficiency in rapid Arabic, sounding so strange near the Mississippi Delta. They were always together, all three, never entering a patio gate without invitation. Most people didn't want them around, even for an honest day's work. My dad, however, trusted their diligence and sought them out to divert rainwater from the flower bed of soaked petunias and marigolds in that wet and humid August. Then one afternoon, home from the movies, that's when we found them, right in our garage kneeling toward Mecca at the corner of Park and Colonial, praying on mats. Even when our automatic garage door growled open, they did not seem startled, unlike us. Embarrassed, we backed the great white nose of our Chrysler out of their way and drove around the block. When we returned, they were finished on their way. Even after seeing them right there facing Mecca in our garage, I almost did not believe it. Our garage, full of things not good enough for the house, our purgatory, was made sacred in that moment and fitting to lift prayers to Allah. Thank you. Yeah, Marianne has to go and actually um, <laughs> feed our meter. <laughs> um, so she's not running away because she's frightened. She's running away because she's frightened of her car being towed. So um, in any case, I also want to thank you guys for coming. I mean, who comes out for poetry? It's, it's, a, it's a tough sell. It's, you know, it's one of these things that I struggle with a lot because you know, I've been teaching for a long time, and my students, it's kind of funny because, you know, I'll be like, now we're going to do poetry. And you can see they look sort of like someone's about to hit them with a baseball bat. You know, they get that look, God, no. And I'm like, I feel bad. 
but you know, every time I sort of like put them in groups, I say, you know, just look at an image or or think about a, a this or that or a line or a word that's pretty that you like, you know, they come up with the most amazing things. It's just poetry is kind of a, in a funny space, you know. Um, on the one hand, everyone does it, but on the other hand, no one really kind of reads it. But it's kind of this thing that's gone into academia so much, you can see why people don't read it. So, I don't know. I don't know. I'm very torn. In any case, um, thank you guys for coming out, and thank everybody. Thank you very much, everyone, who set this up. Um, you know, I, I've done jobs like this. It's tireless. It's thankless. You know, it's not. It's not the funnest thing in the world. So, thank you very much for setting this up. So, most part um, comes from you know where I where I come from, which uh, I grew up like right outside of Denver, between these two little towns, and like every tribe in the world, I mean, everybody from every tribe in the world like comes to Denver and like trickles into the small towns like to the west and the east and north south. So um, I grew up with people just like me, like every mix you could imagine, people who were fully Navajo, people who were nine tribes, people who were half white, people who were this, people who were that, Chippewas, I mean, you name it. And there were a lot of people who were like Chicano, Mexican American, a lot of working class whites. Um, and the one thing I think I have to say that unified us all was the mullet. <laughs> you know, as long as there was business in the front, you know, party in the back, everyone could hang, you know. So, you know, it's just, it's odd what's like the unifying force for people. And I remember, um, you know, you know, it's socially in high school, you just sort of like, you have these little cliques. Well, I was like, I'm always trying to call myself a nerd. I'm always trying to like bring it up a notch. But honestly, I was like the like, <laughs> like don't get near her. There are only three of them. Maybe they smell totally weird people. And I used to eat lunch under the display case. And I'd be like, they can't find me and kick my butt here, you know. And my friend Misty, you know, she was like one of those native chicks that's just like five by five. Like my aunt, <laughs> you know, you do not screw with her. She's walked around like this, you know. And um, God, I remember even the teachers were afraid of her. <laughs> but she saw me eating lunch on the display case one day, and she's like, "Okay, that's it, Erica. Let me let me clear a space for you at the nerds table." And I was like, "Thank you," <laughs> you know. And I got to eat lunch with people, and that was nice. Um, but yeah, so I had a bit of dignity at the end. Um, but there were two other people who were kind of like me. There was Jamie Gibbons, who uh, was kind of mentally handicapped and so he even when he was 18 he asked like people in the fourth grade out he'd be like will you and we'd be like no Jamie no you know and I like gave him he asked me I gave him Lisa Day and I really thought hard about it and like the next day I was like I know what to say I was like we can be friends and I had no idea this is what women always say <laughs> this is always what women say I had no idea so you know and it's kind of a sad thing but um the only the other person his name um who's kind of like in the same social position I was was this guy named Chipper Putt Bark. And I not kidding. <laughs> and now he's on MySpace, he calls himself Charles, you know. Um, he wears blazers too. You can see it's like, oh, I'm not a nerd, I'm wearing a blazer, <laughs> you know. Um, so uh, Chipper, uh, not only was his name Chipper Putt Bark, um, he was, we were all kind of poor, but he was like ridiculously poor. And then he smelled, and he belonged to some strange religion, and he couldn't do holidays. I mean, the poor guy. And like, he also was this thing that I didn't know the word for this, but white people have a word for this. It's called ginger, <laughs> and it means you're so white that you have red hair and freckles and orange eyes. And um, you know, it's one of those situations where you know, white people in my school were like, "I'm white. That's too white." <laughs> it's like insane. And so he would always try to make friends with me, and I'd be like, "Well, go chip. No, no, you know." We get beat up enough alone. If we hang out, it's going to be more than power times 10. <laughs> so I'd be like, no, God, no, I want to live through this, you know. So um, when I was writing this book, you know, I thought a lot about what, what, what you do when you write a book. Like, what's your job? And I, I thought it's, you know, to poetically render what I know. And what I know is where I come from. And it's kind of this weird amalgamated culture. And um, you know, definitely being a nerd is where a lot of what I what I know, where I come from, and just these different people. And one of the one of the people that I couldn't help but think about when I thought about where I came from was my friend named Melissa. And Melissa was let's just say a very talented illustrator, and she would have usually her her artist artistic thing of choice was generally um, 
naked people doing things a probably a 12 year old shouldn't know. <laughs> and so I, I would, you know, of course I'd want to see. But then, you know, we, I lived in fear of her mother coming around the corner and be like, what are you doing? And be like, ah, you know, shove the thing under the bed. You know, so I had to write this poem for her. Um, and uh, it's called Up the Roller Rink, Melissa. So, so that's where we spent our time, the roller rink. All right. At the roller rink, Melissa. At the roller rink, Melissa, you told me how you would make him love you, how he already did, your old white skates clacking against the rim, your hair dyed blonde, and mine dyed blonde too, but darkening in the fluorescent lights. Melissa, only now do I want to tell you how he was only a dark-eyed Indian boy, and I barely a woman when he made me love him. How I've made up stories for him and for all of those boys, yours and mine, stories for me and you. Oh, Melissa, how you disappeared and reappeared on my answering machine like magic. How I hid from your voice and from everyone's. Do you still think of me as an Indian princess? Oh, Melissa, I've held your child and a million other children in these arms, their hair soft against my light brown arms, and I've told no one, no one. Melissa, girl I'll never know again, tell me, where has that dark-eyed boy gone, and what do you know of him? Um, the next one I want to read is, uh, I, I'm not a particularly funny poet, like I'm funny haha -ha when I talk, but my poems aren't funny, so I'm always really sad about that, I'm just not that smart. <laughs> I don't think I'm capable of doing it, you know, I think it's the people with big brains who really know how to do it. But I do have one kind of funny title, but it's only funny to a native audience, so here you go. Let's see. It's called Mama, Don't Let Your Quarter Breeds Grow Up to Be Cowboys. See, it's not that funny. It's so sad. Um, but it's because where I come from, you know, it didn't, again, it didn't matter if you're white, if you're native, if you're, if, you're, if you're Chicano. A lot of us were cowboys. A lot of us, you know, did rodeo and then later did powwow. And so I was wondering, you know, when people came up from outside of town and they were looking at rodeo, did they know, like, how diverse that rodeo actually was? That, you know, people think cowboys, and they think, like, white guys, and, like, they're Chicanos, they're natives, there's, I mean, that's a gathering of nations down there half the time. So I was like, I, I had to write a poem about this. So, Mama, don't let your quarter breeds grow out to be cowboys, but on bunch. <laughs> there they are at the rodeo their black mustaches gleaming, their hands resting on the restless flanks of the horses. Like bullfighters, they know what to do. So beautiful, these cowboys who aren't cowboys, boys I've known from a distance, their hands rough and tender. Their bodies are like the horses' bodies, wet and newly born in the sun and the dust and the heat, their arms exact, their legs fancy dancing, square dancing dancing in between. It's all about that moment, that rope around the neck, that flash of tail, that broken horse that breaks so that it can move the way that makes the audience rise and hold their arms out in prayer. They move, their muscles pulling tight, their arms wearing secrets, crazy horse tattoos under their shirts, filled with spirit, filled with the knowledge of death, running always with the horses, like children running through the fields running their hands through the flowers, running away. So, um, I went to school at the University of Colorado, and, um, you know, a lot of, there were some natives there, but a lot of the native people that I would meet um, were homeless, and they were on the Pearl Street Mall, and, you know, my friend Renee, I was always like complaining, I'm like, I am, I'm never going to find a man. You know, the only men I meet are homeless native guys, you know, it's the only native guys I meet. And, and she was like, you can give them a home. And I was like, you messed up. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, but they were, they were interesting and they were homesick and, you know, they, they would want to talk. And, um, yeah, a lot of them were alcoholics. And the thing about alcohol that people don't know is that um, it's one of those things you can't, after a while, quit cold turkey. And... So, um, if you, for me, I had no problems with giving them a dollar because A, they might freeze to death overnight, and B, 
um, maybe they shouldn't have gotten there, but it really often is, like if they can keep their levels at a certain point, they aren't going to die that night. And I have a friend who was like that, and he's now clean, sober, and teaching on the Tohono um, Matra Reservation. So I don't know, like I, I always kind of thought about that when I hang out with these guys. And, and so this one guy, I remember I was walking on the Pearl Street Mall, and I saw him, he's like, hey sister, and we talked, and um, he was like, you know what, girl? I can make I can make the rain come down. And then he starts doing a John Travolta. And I was like, I'm not Lakota. I don't know. <laughs> Maybe he can. Maybe that's it. I don't know. I'm not going to say it. So it was just like odd. And um, But then I was thinking, it was odd because right at that time, there was this drought of biblical proportions in the Southwest. And I remember thinking, brother, I wish you could bring the rain down. Because I mean, you know, for example, in Navajo territory, um, they, a lot of people are sheep herders, so they would go out and get water for the sheep, they bring it back, drive miles, miles to do this. And these sheep would go to the water, drink, they would still not be you know, satisfied, uh, they would eat poisonous plants, even if instinctually they knew not to do it because they were so thirsty. So I just remember all that was kind of going on in my head, and then I just, you know, I sat down and wrote this. So. It's called Inside Both of Us. The sheep were like the dead, like his eyes on the Pearl Street Mall, and he said he brought the rain down from Pine Ridge. Why couldn't he bring it down in Arizona? Why can't he bring it down inside both of us, moving quickly towards the burning bush, towards the cracked and bloody desert? The weavers bringing the rain down, the bums bringing the rain down. Why can't I bring the rain down? He said, hey, sister, got a dollar, sister, got a home for me, sister. We natives gotta stick together. Just one more dollar will keep me warm all night. It's okay that I put my hand on your long brown shoulder. Put your hand on my long brown heart so the sheep will rise again, so the water will turn to wine and back to water and then bring the rain down inside both of us. So um, along that vein, I think I'm gonna read another poem uh, about a guy I met um, named Samuel. And Samuel was sitting outside um, on the sidewalk one day when I came out the University of Colorado. And he was, he was like, girl, come sit by me. So I did, and he was like, girl, you need some coconut oil. And he had this like jar of coconut oil. And I was like, put it in your hair. And I'm like, taking one for the team. <laughs> you know? Thanks, Samuel. And this guy was fluent in Navajo, fluent in Chippewa, fluent in English, and had a master's degree. And I was like, how the, you know, did you end up here? And I still don't know. I, the man was well-educated and, and smart and fluent in three languages. I, I, it will never stop blowing my mind. So I had to, to, to write this for him. It's called Closer. Ah, Samuel, with your Jesus eyes, how you looked at me that day on the hill by the school with your hands in the air, praying in Navajo and Chippewa for more. How you asked for my name, my tribe, and for my phone number, saying, Sister, 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 how I love your hair, sister, how I love the black of it, sister. Come a little closer here. Put this coconut oil in your hair and make it grow so long, so long. Its promise will cover the world twice over. How much I've learned out here, how much I still want to know, and someday I'll call you and tell you when I finish knowing and speak to you of all of my secrets. Ah, Samuel, how I saw you weeks later, farther down that newly blackened road, giving all of your secrets to that lanky white older boy that you had said on that day on the hill you know the Navajo are shy people. Don't be shy. Come here and hold me, sister, so deep inside. I think I'm just going to read one more because um, I don't want to you know, be like, blah, 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 I've got an audience, <laughs> you know. So, <laughs> yeah, I know some of you guys are extra credit, and I know it's like, well, the lady stopped talking? Awesome, <laughs> you know. So um, I'll just do one more, and then Marianne, if you want to come back up, and if you have any questions, we can, you know, answer questions and stuff, you know. Um, this is called, You Didn't Want a Dollar, You Wanted Me. Ah, Gerald, you didn't want a dollar, you wanted me, by the side of the school in the heat, with all the children just past childhood, milling, milling, waiting, Gerald, for you and for me in the heat, just waiting for you to tell me about how you didn't drink, but that you were thirsty, Gerald, so thirsty in this heat, and did I know where we could get a drink? Just one, because you didn't drink, you never drink, but did I, oh, Gerald, how you beat your wheelchair, and one leg with both fists, how you ran your hands on the length of all of your scars, purple as the sunset in the dying, dying day, 
those Sundance scars, those surgery scars, the war scars. Oh, you told me, didn't you, Gerald, that you were a vet of one war and three wives who all wanted you to stay home. But you were a warrior sister. You said, I'm ugly, but I've gotten a lot of beautiful Indian women. Do you mind if I call you beautiful? No, Gerald, no. But Gerald, when I asked you, when was the last time you'd been home? You said 30 years and that you'd never go home again. You said, there ain't nothing to do there but ride horses. But Jesus, Gerald, you have nothing but one leg and four X's. But I think that you could still ride horses. I really think that you could. And maybe they've been waiting for you to come home. The brown and the black and the paint have been waiting for you to come home and ride them one last time. Ride them past all you've ever known. So, thank you very much. I don't have any answer any questions about like, writing or you know, and stuff like that, you know, you know, questions like that. Someone asked us about writer's block yesterday, and I was like, I don't, I don't know, because I think everybody suffers from it, so it was like, it was one of those panicky kind of moments, but I think I, I, I think I fumbled through it. You did. Yeah. Very well. <laughs> so, I feel like we're the viewer stuff. <laughs> talked about the important ones. I fought for a couple I wanted in there. But pretty much I spread it out on like the living room floor and I like to watch CSI Miami so I would turn on CSI Miami and I would just, you know, I would just pick, I don't know, I tried to make like a natural flow, like have poems about family, but make them flow from one feeling or one theme to another. But it's not, you know, it's not easy. You just kind of it's not easy to get there, but you sort of have a good feeling like when you're there, if that makes any sense. I had a really similar experience, and our publisher is a fantastic editor. Um, and he does these things where he'll be like, is that 1868 reference to the Pueblo Revolt of... And you're like, well, I don't know. <laughs> no. Like, I remember I workshopped a story once where someone... I have this cousin who stole a train. <laughs> and so he was like, is this a colonialist, fetishist, symbol, and I was like, my cousin just stole a train, you know, <laughs> he really did, long story, but um, I had a very similar experience, our editor's really good, and, you know, same thing, I like, spread it out in the hotel room, spread it out in the office, spread it out at home, you know, and, and I cut most of my book, seriously, like, I can't believe he took that book, like, John Crawford is the book, because... I, I gave him a mess. I was like, here is a piece of crap. And he was like, let's shape it into beauty. You know, so it's like, you know, uh, honestly, I I cut swaths of poems and then rewrote entire poems. And like I have a, my entire first section is completely new. So it, it's it's like this, mine was an eight year process, woo, as it was. Sorry about that. And um, that's right. That's right. <laughs> I talk with my hands, I'm always, um, so by the end of it, it was as if all those like eight years I spent writing it condensed like into one spot, you know what I mean? I felt like I had lived eight years in like three months, you know, so, so yeah, yeah. And I had to write like almost all new poems because my old poems were so bad. No, <laughs> so I, I saw her start over. Over. <laughs> <It's not. laughs> Like, let me give you a hundred poems, John. Yeah. Yeah. No, I saw her original but, yeah. but uh, yeah. So it sounds like editing mm -hmm. became something of um, yes, its own thing. Mm -hmm. I know that well, I, I went to grad school for creative writing, and poetry is probably what made me stop. I did a poetry class, and it was so hard. And I just, I've never been that much of an editor yeah, that's, that's of my own stuff. Good. And, you know, I could edit a short story, but editing poetry, I mean, you're pretty much rewriting it when you start to edit it because you change the first line and the whole thing just, at least it, the way that I had problems with it. So, did you guys both have any, how did you feel about editing uh, before you started? That one had and to have been, uh, now that feel that like you're much better at it? Or you just it? <laughs> I actually, I actually like editing. I mean, I kind of find it like a challenge to see how I can make a poem better. And usually it involves taking out rather than putting in. Um, 
And Erica was a really big help to me. When was that done? She, you know, she has a lot of lyricism in her work, and she hated my enjambments. She would just be like, oh, you know, she hated them. And she would say, oh, I would drive her crazy because she teaches them. And so she said, read your, read your poems aloud and see where you're, see where they break naturally. And I would have told all of you to do that because that, I mean, I'm 38 years old, and I'm like, it was like an epiphany. Yeah. So. Yeah. That's really something important, and I think the other thing I can say about that is um, yeah, yeah. put your palms away. No. Like sometimes you have to trash them. Sometimes like they're never going to be there, and you just start over. But other times you put them away yeah. for maybe like a month, yeah. okay. and then you look okay. at them with fresh eyes, right. and it makes it. Yeah, I'm like thinking as you're saying, I'm like, yeah, <laughs> yeah. Um, that's really really cool. I think. Um, well, you know, I, I studied with Lorna Cervantes, and she's this um, famous Chicana poet. She's this lovely, wild woman. I love Lorna. And she used to say, it's revision, Erica. It's not just revision. Try to re-envision it so that it's beautiful again. You know, like you're saying, it's like a sculpture. You're sort of cutting and cutting down into something beautiful, you know. Um, but sometimes you accidentally cut the head off. <laughs> so you have to start with a new block of wood. <laughs>